be in the house of the Lord tonight, isn't it? Yes. Amen. Yes. In the house yes. of the Lord. I'm looking forward to what God is going to do tonight, getting into the Word of God. Exciting things are happening, and I'm excited for what God is going to do. I don't know about you, but I've been blessed this week. Have you been blessed? Yes. yes. God is good all the time. And uh, so we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to go to God in prayer. We're going to invite the Lord into this place. Uh, let's do that. Let's do that first, and then we'll go on to some of the uh, other things that we're going to uh, do. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now. God, you're wonderful, you're worthy, you're holy, you're mighty, God. Lord, we invite you into this house. We magnify you, God. We glorify you, Lord. Speak into our hearts tonight. Speak into our minds tonight, God. As we delve into your word, Lord, let it come to life inside of us, O oh Lord. Guide us and lead us into a deeper walk with you, O oh God. Clarify, Lord, things that are, are questioning and plaguing our minds, God, on how you are and who you are, God. Lord Jesus, I ask you, Lord, for your strength and your anointing to sweep through this house, O oh God. Your power, Lord, to step into this place, God. Lord Jesus, you are worthy, you are wonderful, you are mighty, O oh Lord, and I exalt your name, God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I worship you, God. I love you, Jesus. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. Lord Jesus. A few prayer requests that uh, need God to touch in. There's some uh, needs that God needs to move in, and God knows what they are. But we're just going to take them to God and say, God, I need you to touch these needs. Do you, anybody have a, a soul on your mind, a heart that you need God to touch? Uh, somebody that uh, you've been talking to, dealing with? I met an elderly man. Yes. I met an elderly man that just uh, uh, just the other day that uh, was a neat, neat man to talk to, and I'm looking forward to talking to him further. Uh, about what God is doing and the good things that God is doing in, in our lives. I'm, I'm looking forward to everything. Every time I meet somebody new, it's neat to see and talk to them about the goodness of God because they're always looking. They're always hungry. Uh, I also know that uh, God is a healer. and So if there's some that are sick in their body, we want God to touch them. And so if you know somebody sick, just do it with the up raising of your hand. You know somebody that needs a touch from God. God knows who that is. God knows specifically who that person is and what that need is that they have. And so let's take these needs to the Lord tonight and ask God to touch these needs. We've invited him into the house. Now let's ask him to touch these situations. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now, God. You are a prayer answerer. You are a healer, God. You know every need that is in this house tonight, God. You know every situation, every circumstance, every struggle, every trial, God. Lord Jesus, you know the healing that needs to take place in that life. Uh, Lord, you know those people that we talk to each and every week, God. Uh, that, Lord, you can move into and you can touch and you can strengthen, God. Lord, draw those that are hungry, Lord. Uh, draw us, Lord, uh, to be able to reach out to those people, God. Uh, and teach them your word and teach them your way and show them the hope that is there in you, oh God, and you alone. Lord Jesus, heal, Lord. Oh, you said by your stripes we are healed. You said in the name of Jesus that if we ask anything in your name that you would do. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, God, Lord Jesus, we ask you to heal. We, uh, oh, we ask you to move, Lord, right now in that situation. You see the circumstance in that family right now, God. I'm asking you, Lord, to send your strength down. Send your peace down that passes all understanding, God. Lord Jesus, touch, Lord, in that family that's lost a loved one, God. Touch, Lord, in that family, Lord, that has a family member that's sick with cancer, Lord. Cancer has no dominion in that body, God. I'm asking you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in you in the name of Jesus Christ. Put your power and your strength and your healing power into their life right now in the name of Jesus. I believe, Lord, that you are a healer, and I believe you can touch, God. 
I believe you can move, Lord, in this place, Lord. And I, I want to see you, Lord, every time I come into this house, God. Move in a mighty way on each of us, Lord. Don't ever let us leave here the same as we came, God. But, Lord, strengthen us in this place. And we'll give you praise and glory and honor, Lord. We'll worship you for everything you're doing and everything you're going to do, God. Let your power flow through us. Let your strength flow through us, God. Let your anointing sweep through us, Lord, in this place. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I'll worship you, God. I'll worship you, Lord. I praise your name. Praise your name. You can be seated in this place tonight. Uh, offering plate is in the back. Uh, uh, give, I'll make sure it's where you can get to it. Uh, let the uh, Lord uh, give us the Lord has blessed you, and I believe he has blessed us all. And so I'm excited about what God is doing. Let me remind you of a prayer meeting tomorrow night at 630. God is going to be in this place. Yes. And uh, I believe God is going to strengthen and God is going to anoint. We have uh, had uh, had some good prayer meetings. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sister Sergeant. Let's, let's get into the Word of God. He's taking his podium with him. Um, we had this Sunday at 4 o'clock. Ladies are meeting at my house to go swimming. And... The gentlemen are meeting at Madison County Lake to go fishing. Y'all yeah. <laughs> have fun with that. <laughs> and um, that will be fun, though, and, and it's, it's going to be, yes. Um, if it rains, we will still do something. I don't know what the guys will do, but we'll do something if it rains. But um, guys, make sure you have your fishing license if you're not a senior citizen. And um, be prepared to get a permit out there. Ladies, just come swim. We're just going to have fun. It's going to be relaxed. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then August the, let me double check my calendar here. I think it's the 8th, but it may not be. Yes, it is. August the 8th, uh, ladies, we're going to do a paint night here at the church, and the guys are going to go to Pastor's house and go swimming, so we're going to switch up there so everybody has a, a chance. Per Brother Donovan, you reminded me of that. Also, on August the 2nd, we have a ladies' rally in Victory Tabernacle, and I'd really love for all my ladies to be there with me. Um, I need your support. So I, I'm going to be speaking that night, and I would love to have, um, I'd love to have my church ladies with me. Also, on the 21st, hmm? no, yeah, it's on my phone, which is videoing at the moment. I believe it's August the 21st. We will be doing a homeless lunch uh, at the laundry mat, and we will also be doing a clothes drive. So if you have adults, small adult, big adult, doesn't matter as long as it's adults, summer clothes or shoes that you can donate, or if you know somebody who is just getting rid of a bunch of, of clothes like that that's in good condition, uh, see Sister BJ and we're going to do a closed drive. We'll have a place downstairs where those can go until that time and that way the homeless can go through them, get what they want, what they can use. Um, see Sister BJ for more details on that. And we will also be serving lunch that day. So if you can help, we appreciate it. We'll need somebody to work the clothing section and we'll need somebody to serve food. It'll probably be about four hours. Is that right? At 10 to 2 roughly. You know, and if you can only be part of that time, that's fine. Just we need to know. Um, and that, that's a great blessing to our community. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk further about that. And then on August the 29th is our homecoming service. We're really excited about that. Um, New Vision will have been in Huntsville for 20 years as of the end of this year, the fall of this year. Yeah. Pastor and I have been um, here for 10. Yes. So. We're real excited to celebrate that. Brother Sadler is coming, and that is August the 29th. So if you have vacation plans for that day, change them. Yeah, so that's right. <laughs> we need y'all here. Uh, I was somewhat kidding about that, but seriously, be here. So um, Bible study is explaining the word. Preaching is proclaiming it. Bible study is studying it or uh, explaining it. And, and that is so vitally important. Okay, I, you can read the word and God can fill you with just understanding and knowledge and, and whatever. 
but this is the way this is the way this works when you tell a child something you use word pictures that that child will understand you say hot instead of don't touch the stove because that can cause three to third degree burns and you can have scars for the rest of your life and then you're going to have trauma and PTSD anytime you get around something. If you don't explain all of that, you just say, don't touch, it's hot. Because that's where that understanding and knowledge goes. Yep. Now they can burn themselves and they can say, oh, hot, don't touch. And so they understand pain is associated with that decision. Yep. But as you get older, you should be able to understand a deeper process of things. Walking with God is the same way. You can understand what the Bible is saying to a certain degree, but God has given us the capacity to learn things and understand them on a deeper level. Yeah. But he's only going to allow you to understand to the depth that you're willing to invest. That's right. So if you're only using coloring sheets and inspirational words to understand the word of God, you're not going to get a deep revelation. That's right. right. You've got to pursue the understanding of what God's word is saying. That's right. And so history doesn't always give you that understanding, but it lays a groundwork for the Holy Ghost to work through and help you understand things. Right. There are verses that I have read a thousand times and I thought, that's a really great verse. Yes, it is. That's a good verse. But then when I start reading into the context and I know the history behind it, or I understand who's talking to who and and what that's coming out of or the trial that that person's coming out of or what they're playing, what part they're playing. Then when I go back and read that verse, I'm like, wow, wow, look at that. Right. When you know that David just buried his baby son when he says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Yeah. That's a little bit more relatable yes. than when you're already dressed and just ready to go to church and worship. Yep. It's relatable when you're walking away from a graveside. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But you've got to study to know those things. That's and right. that's where the depth comes from. Right. So we're going to look at uh, context, historical setting, the principles, and the implications of the narratives. So there's one thing that I think is just vitally important when you're reading the Bible. You have to know that God's spirit, he is perfect. The humanity that he uses is not. Okay? Just because God uses someone does not make that person perfect. God can use you in spite of you. Right. We're all a walking example of that. Hallelujah. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Yes. So through the Bible, we do see that even those who hear God's voice directly sometimes misinterpret it. Let me say that again. <laughs> in the Bible, there are times when people who God used directly, he spoke to them face to face like he would speak to a friend. Yeah. And they still misinterpret what he's saying or they misinterpret his will. So for us to think that we've always got the mind of God and doing things perfectly and we ain't going to mess it up because God is telling us to do this, well, that's hogwash. Yep, that's right. And it's not an example given by the Bible. So that this is one of the things. For instance, you know, Moses has heard from God. He's been instrumental in delivering God's people from Egypt. And they get out into the Red Sea and he's like, just be still and be patient. The Lord will fight your battle for you. Just be still and watch that God's going to work this out. And God's like, you on your own. I didn't tell you to do that. I said move. Yeah. And Moses is like, <clears throat> what I meant to say was we're going to walk through. I may have misinterpreted that just a little bit. So there are going to be times when you're going to see the person that God is using may say, okay, I may not have gotten that just right. right. And that's okay because we're also going to see how to handle that when it's a oops, when maybe we didn't get it quite right because we're human. And that's the most awesome thing about the Bible is that it shows real people and what happens in a real life when real people make real mistakes and how to deal with it. Uh -huh. And it tells you also how not to deal with it. Some by example. So we'll see how to correct those things and how to get back on track um, because the other option is just curl up and die. You know, well, I failed God, I misunderstood, I misinterpreted 
I thought he was telling me to do such and such and I did this and it didn't work out right. So I guess I'm going to go eat worms. I mean, I mean, that's an option. You can do that. It's not the greatest one, but whatever. So we'll see also that God's will is not always like we think it will look. It, it looks differently than what we think it will look like. Yep. So <laughs> it is funny People normally look at God's will as being like, there's this option, this option, and then there's that option that must be God's. Because it's grand, it's awesome, it's huge, it's fancy, it's got big lights. When really God's option is right here saying, go this way, do this. You know, it's not as fancy, but this is what God wants you to do. So just because the perfect situation presents itself does not mean that that's what God has designed for us. Oh. Someone said, well, if it's an open door, God's opened it, and you need to walk through it. Nope. No. He's not the only one that's got hands that can open a door. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just because a door opens, sometimes that means a door is open, and that's it. Doesn't mean that that's the one that we're supposed to go through. That's right. Um, that's why you've got to be constant. You've got to be in his word. You've got to be in prayer. You've got to have the mind of God and make sure it lines up with his word. His word and his will will never contradict themselves. That's right. Never. And we've got to not become distracted. And that will right. keep us focused on, the, on our walk with God. Okay, so last week we finished our Bible study with the death of Abner. And it was sad because Abner was kind of, had been shook into a place where he was trying to change his direction. And he had had this allegiance with David and, and things were starting to, to go like it should. But Joab, who had a family beef with Abner, kind of pulls him off to the side like he's going to tell him something secret, and then he shanks him, and Abner dies. Yep. And that's, that's most unfortunate, most unfortunate. Um, one of the reasons why this was so, so tragic is because if David really wanted to take the throne by force, he could have. He could have, right. but it wouldn't have acquired the same respect right. as David stepping back and saying, God, your will be done. Truthfully, when we take things in our own hands, that's, that's kind of the way it is. Yep. Yep. We can make it happen, but in the long run, it's not going to have the same effect as if God had lined it out. That's right. Abner was important because he was the driving force behind everything that the current king, who was Saul's son, everything he was doing, Abner was calling the shots. And so when Abner died, Ishbosheth, who was Saul's last living legitimate heir, he was lost. Have you ever seen somebody who has been driven by a manipulative force like their entire life? Yeah, yeah. Like they do this and this because somebody was telling them that that's what they needed to be done and needed to do. And then when that person's not speaking to them anymore, they're like, do I need to go tie my shoes? What do I need to do? Should I be eating right now? What? I've seen people like that. Yeah. They've had that, that nagging voice. I've seen, um, people who had a parent that was like that constantly just and if they weren't telling them what to do they were trying to guilt them into doing something when that person grows up and gets married they expect their spouse to be that way right. and so they don't even know how to pour their own bowl of cereal because nobody told them to do it right. it's sad but that's kind of the, the the indication that's happening here abner has put ishbosheth in as king because he knew he would be a puppet he could do anything that abner wanted him to do and so now that he is, Abner is dead, Ishbosheth has no leadership, he has no direction, he has no drive and no willingness to be king. More importantly, he has no anointing because he wasn't supposed to be a king to start with. Right. Yeah. So he takes a lot of naps and he works up a depression. Notice I didn't say he fell into depression. He worked on it. He, he created it, and then he thrived in it, and he went to bed. That, that's pretty much how that happened. 
So tonight we're going to begin, and just to let me throw that in, do you know what the number one God-given cure for depression is? A walk. Yep. Exercise. Yep. <laughs> if you want to just go in bed and stay there forever, all you're doing is pumping more depressants into your body. But God gave us the ability, when you walk and have exercise, you're actually re releasing endorphins into your brain. It's the same chemical response than an antidepressant gives. That's right. <clears throat> God designed that for a purpose. Yep. Okay. So anyway, he takes lots of naps and he works up a depression. And so tonight we're going to begin our Bible study in 2 Samuel chapter 4. And we're going to go halfway through 5. So one day, while Ishbosheth is resting from his depression and, and life, two of his military leaders come in where he is quite literally just chilling on his bed. Okay? He's just laying there. And they walk in to kill him. That's long story short. That's pretty much what's in chapter 5. They go in and kill him. It's a bloody mess. And they take his head as a trophy and they hightail it out of Dodge and they run to David. Okay, now I just condensed like 6, 7, 8, 10 verses into one right there. But um, that, that's how that happened. So Ishbosheth is not in battle, he's in bed. And his military leaders, nobody else's military leaders, his military leaders come and kill him. Now, they're from the same tribe. They're actually from Benjamin. They're from his, his people. But, you know, they're thinking, okay, well, Abner's not calling the shots anymore. We all know that Ishbosheth is not going to make it. Ishbosheth knows he's not going to make it. That's why he's in bed. So let's just move this along. We'll kill him. We'll take his head to David. We'll be given some great position in the kingdom because we have expedited David's ascent to the throne. Now, if they had known anything about David's history, they would know this never goes well. David has never rewarded someone for being a coward yep. or for doing something that is rogue and not, um, not with honor. Okay? Now, from the previous Bible studies, we know that there's a lot of political undertones in this story. There always are. Unfortunately, politics are a way of life, and we know that politics are not about one person in general. There's always a whole lot of people that are affected when it comes to politics, right? Everybody awake? Yeah. Everybody, I know, everybody's kind of like, <sighs> yes, <laughs> I know, so it's Wednesday, it's rough, I know. All right, so we know that David is anointed, we know that David is called to be king yep. but he is currently only the king of judah right. but david has never taken any actions not one to kill or remove saul or any of his family members from the throne david knew that if god had called him to be king that he would place him on the throne and he didn't have to do anything to fix that oh that's hard when you know god's called you to a place and you have the ability to oh, expedite oh. that right. And sometimes it's not even just, I want to move this along, but it kind of gets in that blurred line of God has given me the ability to fulfill his will by removing the obstacles and placing myself where he has called me. Yeah. That must be the Lord's will. Get out the way. Sometimes God's will sounds like that in our mind. It's usually not. But God had, if God had called him to be king, he knew that God would place him on the throne. And that's faith. That, that's faith, because you're not handling it. You're saying, God, it's in your hands. But not everybody had the faith in God's calling that David had. Other people also saw the place that David was supposed to end up, but they didn't have the relationship with God to see the process. This is why the people that you take counsel from are so vitally important. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Brother Woodward once said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you hang around a hateful old hag all, all the time, just give it a few weeks and you're going to be a hateful old hag. Okay? Right. And that's just the way that is. That is yeah. If you are around someone who's constantly wasting money and just doing the stuff and acting on whims and running from emotion to emotion, Give it just a little bit of time, and you're going to be doing the same thing. That's right. 
It's yeah. just that's the way it is. Surround yourself with people who are called by God and have the wisdom, yeah. the wisdom to control their own life in God's purpose. Yeah. And that's so, so vitally important. Yes. And so David had people in his company who saw what God was calling him to, but didn't quite understand the process. Yep. And they might be a little bit self-serving as well. So we're going to pick up, um, I put 2 Samuel 3 and 8. I think it's actually, I think it's actually 4 and 8. Um, and I pulled up, I didn't, just, y'all read your own Bible. Because <laughs> I forgot to put it in. I pulled up 2 Samuel, Pastor, I just forgot to bring the verse up. Sorry. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron. And said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my Lord, the king, this day of Saul and of his seed. So they've got this head. And they're like, look what the Lord did for you. And David's like, really? It's not the Lord standing there holding that head. It's you, doofus. <laughs> doofus is not in there, but it's, it should be. That's my interpretation. They're so proud of themselves for helping David get rid of his enemies. And they think all of his seed, all of his sons. David's furious. He is furious. And he said, God is the one that has delivered me from all of my enemies. I didn't need your help. God didn't need your help. Y'all just a little bit dumb. Why are you doing this? And then he reminded them of the Amalekite that took credit for King Saul's death. And he was like, you remember him? Yeah, we killed him. Why would I not do the same thing to you? You killed a righteous man while he was chilling out in his own bed. This was not even an honorable death. Have you lost your mind? Why did you do this? And so he has the, the two men that have done this. He has them killed. And this is, this is so vitally important because everything that David is doing, Israel is watching. And if it ever came across, if it ever came across to Israel that David may have had something to do with killing right. Saul or Saul's family, right. Right. he would have lost the respect. Yes, the did. anointing was on David that God was going to put him there, not that he had to remove Saul and his, his family. And so he wanted to make sure that he was completely separated from this. He wanted to know that these men acted on their own. And so he has them killed, and it's, it's pretty grotesque. He, like, cuts off their hands and their feet, and then he hangs them up over this pool. And well, I don't understand that because that would have been really gross, but whatever. That's what he did. You can read about that on your own in 2 Samuel chapter 4. Anyway, um, and so David has separated himself from this. Because he wanted to make sure that people knew it wasn't him that was trying to push the will of God. How many times have we gotten in the way of God doing his will in our life? Think about that. Like, you know, God has got us set on a path and we're like, Woo, let's run ahead and do this. And God's going, whoa, hold back. And it may even delay his plan a little bit because we got a little bit overzealous about what he was doing. Yeah. Mm. So David rebuke, rebukes the men and he has them killed, not just because they killed Ishbosheth, but because they did it so dishonorably, whatever. Um, and it appears to David, because these men have said, we have gotten rid of Saul is now gone, God got rid of Saul and his seed. It appears to David that the legitimate heirs to Saul's throne are gone. Now, in this society... As you know, when, when a king dies, his son takes the throne. And if that son dies, then the, the king's grandson takes the throne. Well, he had four sons, or was it four? Yeah, he had four sons by his wife. Saul had four sons by his wife. Three of them died on the battlefield yep. the day that Saul died. The fourth was Ishbosheth, and now he's dead. Okay? So it sounds like there's all of Saul's sons are gone. Except if there's a grandson. Now, a grandson would have a right to the throne. 
And he does have two sons. Saul had two sons by his concubine, Rizba. But they're not really a threat because they're the sons of a concubine. And he know, we know that Saul's daughters have sons, but they're not a threat because their mama is, is the daughter of a king. And it, it's, not, it's not king's son, grandson. It was king daughter, grandson. And so they're not important. I mean, they are important, but they're not aligned to the throne. However, there's one, one person still that could have a claim to the throne. But David doesn't know about him. And it mentions him really quickly in this chapter. But we're going to come back to him. So as far as David knows, all of Saul's legitimate heirs to the throne are gone. Okay? We know that Rizpa has two adult sons. We know that Saul has some grandsons out there, but their, their mama kind of ruins their chances of the throne. So as far as David understands, they're all gone. Why is that important? It's because in this culture, in this history, whenever a king would take a throne, if he was not from the bloodline, the previous king's family would be killed. That's right. Yep. Because blood is, is thick, and there would always have been a, a legitimate somewhere or another. And we see this even into um, the 20th century when the king of Russia or the governor, whatever he was, what was the czar? He was like the highest whatever in Russia. When he was killed, they killed his entire family just to make sure that there was nobody that would come up and try to take that political place of leadership. So it, it's not that foreign of a concept that the entire family would be wiped out. But David had made an oath to Jonathan that he would not do that. He would honor his family and he would protect him. And so when others are coming in trying to wipe out Saul's family, David's furious. He's like, I didn't tell you to do this. Stop. Stop. Okay. So at this point, he thinks that all the legitimate heirs are gone. But there is one that's still mentioned, but we will come back to him. So in chapter 5, chapter 5, I know we're not shouting and running around the building tonight, but we're learning. We're learning. So, anybody know what the capital of Israel is? We just recently put the U.S. Embassy there. Jerusalem. Right? Okay. Uh, where is that? Up, up here. It's up there? Like, there. In there? Okay. Maybe. It is almost directly in the middle of the Promised Land. So you have all of the promised land kind of around it, and then you have this, this hilltop um, in the middle of Israel, right? I'm going to give you a little bit of history on it, but not, not much. Okay, I promise. Um, oh, I skipped something. Y'all, I'm airheaded tonight. Are y'all still with me? Everybody take a deep breath, and we'll, we'll say that I meant to do this. Now that Saul's family is out of the way, all of Israel comes to David in Hebron, where he's at, and they give him this pretty little speech, and they anoint him as king. Now remember, he's been king over Judah, but not the other 11 tribes. And so now that all of Saul's descendants are out of the way, they're all like, oh yeah, David, we wanted you to be king all along. Now that Saul's out of the way and his family's out of the way, we recognize that you should have been king all along. Yep, mm -hmm, we have complete loyalty to you. And so the people anoint him as king. So God has acknowledged that David is king. The people have acknowledged that David is king. But there's still one person who has not acknowledged him as king. David is now 37 years old. He will reign as king for a total of 40 years, including the time that he's already reigned in the, as the king of Judah. So now it is time to set up his kingdom. Okay? Remember, for almost 10 years, he's been running in the wilderness. He was in his 20s. He's a young kid when he's running in the wilderness. Like, God is developing him in his youth. He has waited. He has let God do exactly what needs to happen. 
He has let God open the doors, and now he is recognized as king amongst Israel. And it's time to set up the kingdom. The door is open. He's ready to go into it. He's ready to go into his ministry. He's ready to see revival. The day has arrived. And David gathers his men. And he goes to the middle of the promised land. However, for the last several hundred years, while they have lived in the promised land, there was one area that still was inhabited by Canaanites. It's called Jebus. And it is the place of the Jebusites. Because we read in Joshua chapter 15 and 63 that when the Israelites went in and conquered the promised land, they could not drive out the Jebusites. And so the Jebusites stayed. On this fortified hill, in their own little city, just chilling out with the children of Israel all the way around them. But the enemy was at the heart of Israel in a fortified city, chilling. It was a small city. There wasn't a lot of people there, but they were the enemy. They were the Jebusites. In 2 Samuel, we read about this, this story where David goes to the middle and he goes to this fortified city, but it's not called Jebus there. It's called Jerusalem. Because 2 Samuel is written after the account. So let me give you an example of that. If I were writing a letter, let's see, in the late 1700s, if I were right here in this area and I was writing a letter to someone in Virginia a family member in Virginia and I was telling them about my home right here I would say in the home of Twickingham I have set up a home and I've got a, a homestead and blah 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 do y'all know where Twickingham is Huntsville. it's what you call Huntsville now but if I wrote it today I would say in Huntsville such and such and such and such because it changed names over time and so I could say back in the 1700s Huntsville was you know this big and this big and this big but they wouldn't have known who Huntsville was back in that time right. so that's why when you read in Chronicles it talks about Jebus but if you read in 2nd Samuel it calls it Jerusalem because it was a difference in when it was written and what time area they're talking about right. it's the same time but they're talking from a different point okay so the city is sitting in the middle of Israelite territory for years as a reminder that they could not conquer it. Look at the Israelites. They have victories all around them. They have all these people that they've driven out, all this land they have acquired. But there's like this one festering little pimple in the middle of their town that they just can't seem to get rid of. And it's the Jebusites. They're just there. I think when the Bible talks about laying aside every weight that easily besets you, I, I think of the Jebusites. You know, you've got all of these victories, but there's that one thing that just keeps tripping you up. Yeah. That one thing that shows up every time you get victories, oh, but there's that. Right. Yeah. There's always that. You know, sure, God has healed my body, but... That's my thorn in the flesh. It's going to be there forever. Well, that was the Jebusites. Because they had a city unlike any other. It's up on a hill. It's fortified. It's got big walls. But you know what has to happen inside of a city? you got to have water. Yep. And you got to have some cisterns. And you got to have drainage. you got to have gutters. And so in this city, they had chilled out for all these years. And the Israelites were okay with the enemy living in their territory. They're going to their place to worship, and they're like, oh, there's Shebu. And they just keep going. They're comfortable with their, their little Canaanite ritual people being there. That just burns me up. I don't know. 
The Jebusites had seen kings come and go. They had seen family warrants. I can just see them sitting up there on their walls with their popcorns going, mm hmm Saul's after David again. Yep, you see, oh, almost got him. Hmm. Wonder if he'll get him tomorrow. They're just watching the show. They're chilling. But they had never had an encounter with the one that God placed on the throne. Right. You see, they had seen Saul come and go. They had seen Ishbosheth come and go. Right. Both kings of Israel, but they had never met a David. Right. They had never met the man that God placed right. in that position as yeah. king. See, some things are just pushed aside and swept under the rug because they're too hard to handle. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when God places you in that place of leadership or God puts you in that yeah. position, there ain't nothing yeah. too big. Right. Right. There is no stronghold right. too powerful right. yeah. that God can't pull it down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was exciting to me because I thought, you know, <laughs> there are some things that, that the devil's just happy to have in our territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe some things in our lives or in our city that we've just ignored because, you know, well, they've been there forever or whatever. Strongholds about to come down. Yeah, that's right. That's all I got to say about that. Strongholds are coming down. That's right. All right. So David begins to approach his very first battle as the full fledged king of Israel. God has called him king. The people see him as king. But when he approaches the city, the enemy attacks him where he has not yet surrendered to God. David had yet to see himself. As king. The people saw him as king. God saw him as king. But David hadn't accepted it yet. And so the enemy has a perfect approach. Let's attack his identity. That battle plan has not changed in 3,000 years. That's still the way the devil comes at us. And so the Jebusites yell down from the walls and they begin to insult David. Chapter 5, verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thank you. David cannot come in hither. Let me give you the uh, interpretation of that. Even our blind, one-legged men can take you down. In fact, we're going to put the special ones up there on the wall because they can stop you, David. You're nothing. We've been here so long, you can't even touch us. Who do you think you are? We've seen kings come and go. You're no different. Bring it on. I'm sure they've probably used that approach before. They may have said something similar to Saul, and Saul's like, well, you know, you got a point. <laughs> yeah, all right then, I'll catch you later. Yeah. Ishbosheth was probably like, yep, there was a good size. And just walked. But today, they met the king that God placed in, in this position. It backfired. You see, when they start hollering out to David, saying, son, you are nothing. Our blind and our lame, our most feeble people could take you down. Don't even try it. You're worthless. You can't do this. David was like, game on. Game on. He sends his men and even offers an incentive to one to the one that makes it there first. He's like, all right, on your mark, get set. In fact, the one who makes it up there first and conquers, conquers the Jebusites, I'm going to make you chief and captain over my army. Y'all ready? Set on your marks. Go. And they took off. David said on that day, this is verse 8, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites. You see, this is the thing. The Jebusites were so arrogant because they had these huge walls around their city. But they forgot where water comes in, other things can come in as well. That's right. And so this is the same little tunnel that Hezekiah is going to use in the future. It's like it's got a lot of key elements here. And I wish I had to put up the pictures and I forgot to say. But anyway, um, so he has like this tunnel of water that goes up into the hill. 
And this is where most likely the men got in. So whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. He's saying, listen, even the blind and the lame are up there mocking us. Take them down. Take them down. According to 1 Chronicles 11, 4 through 6, we know that Joab actually wins that challenge. He's the first one. He's like, all right, challenge taken. Let's go. And he gets up there and conquers the Jebusites. That very day, David took control of the enemy stronghold that had been situated for hundreds of years in the middle of the land that God promised to his people. Now, what's amazing about that? is that God allowed what was other people's negligence. See, the children of Israel didn't have the faith in God to drive out the Jebusites when they first went. Right. And that looked like a failure. And really, in that time, it was. But God used what was a failure on the man's Ooh. behalf to set up a kingdom for the one he calls in the future. Yeah. Now, this is a perfect strategy because the Jebusites stronghold didn't belong to any tribe so what was a failure in the past was used to unify all the tribes in the future and this became mount zion it was the home of david and eventually became part of the the hill where the first tabernacle was built all enemy territory for hundreds of years until david steps into his position this is the place where David finally recognizes that he is called to be king. When he sees what God has allowed to happen with him. Verse 12, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Even neighboring kings recognized that David had been called to be king in this area. They recognized the anointing. In fact, it says that the king of Tyre sent, um, sent great like cedar trees and all kinds of supplies and craftsmen and all this stuff to make David this great house, this palace. He recognized David as king. And after that, David recognized himself. This is the key. When we understand who we are and why God chose us, that's when revival happens. Yeah. Yeah. See, David could have had an identity crisis the entire time he was on the throne, and God could not have used him like he did because David recognized who he was. How would you walk into your job if you fully understood that you were a child of God and that you were called to reach the people that you come in contact with. I read something today that said when you walk into the room, the atmosphere should yeah. change. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. I do. I do not think that we should be inferior. We shouldn't be arrogant in any way, form, or fashion. But if we have spiritual authority like we're supposed yeah. to have... We should walk into a room and people who are not right with God can feel it. And it doesn't always have, it can be a comforting feel. You should be able to walk into an area of complete and total disaster. And when you walk on the scene, comfort comes with you. You should be able to walk into a place where demons are on their playground. And they know you're there. And they start moving. Mm -hmm. Or people say, oh, there's something different. When, yeah. when I started working at Albert's, one of the ladies told me, she said, you know, we used to have stuff fly off the shelves and doors just open and all kinds of stuff. She said, we kid around about the ghost that's in the um, the shed back there. She said, she said, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know. She said, that's so weird. He just disappeared. I don't know. Um, she said, oh, yeah, we, we have a ghost that lives around here, but we haven't seen him. Haven't seen him in a long... I don't know. 
I don't know whether that was really a ghost or just a draft coming in from under the cooler. <laughs> Who knows? But something should change when you walk in the room. And for the purpose of his kingdom. You see, God didn't give you spiritual authority so you could walk in and say, Whoa, I got spiritual authority. Look at me. That's right. That's right. It is only for the purpose of building his kingdom. Yes. Right. Not yours, not mine, his. Yes. And when we understand who we are and that we are called to exalt his kingdom, that's when revival happens in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our city. Yes. I'm going to end tonight with, with this, this place because it's so vital. <laughs> David makes mistakes. I mean, he, he makes some big ones. He really does. Like, there, there's some big ones. And to say that David was always just, woohoo, I'm God's person, is really a little bit naive. Because there are verses in Psalms where David is like, let me die. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there are times when he doesn't want to go on, or he doesn't understand why everything is going wrong. He doesn't understand why people are trying to kill him, or there's whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of times when he brought that on himself. I mean, God clearly said you should have one wife. Right. Well, even after he sets up Jerusalem, he just keeps adding the concubines and the wives. I mean, just stacking them up like trophies. And then he's there's Psalms where he's running from one of his sons who's trying to kill him. And he's like, oh, Lord, I just don't even know. And God's like, yeah, I know, right? Like, <laughs> maybe you should have listened. You know, but when it comes down to it, the thing that makes David a man after God's own heart is not his perfection. It's his repentance. Yeah. It's that he acknowledges when he messes up and he goes to God with a contrite heart. He goes to God with a broken spirit and he says, search me. Oh, my word. When was the last time in our prayer we said, God, search me? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what happens when God searches you? You have to be willing to hear what he finds. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think about that. Search me, Lord. Oh, I'm so glad I'm good. All right. No. If you really have God search you, he's going to find some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like doing that virus check on your laptop. You're going, please don't have a, please don't. Oh, there's a virus. Yep. There it is. Had a feeling it might be there but you couldn't really put your finger on it and then you do the virus scan and it's like we have detected 75 viruses on your laptop so you can look at that and say huh my laptop has viruses i guess i need to just get used to it working slower selling all my information to china i'll sit here for 45 minutes and let it try to load windows We'll just make that happen. I'll allow extra time whenever I need to write a paper because it's going to shut down all of my programs and I'll have to restart it five times. Or you can deal with it. Right. Right. And, and the best thing to do is to wipe it clean yes. and get right. everything out of it right. and start right. over. Oh, that's right. And so instead of trying to say, well, let's, okay, we're going to choose that virus and get rid of it today. <laughs> if we went to God and said, Lord, take it all out everything everything let me come to you fresh and new everything freshly oh, stir up the gift that is in me and restore my heart and my mind instead of trying to spot heal and band-aid fix and when you say god search me that's what really needs to happen that doesn't mean that everything in your life is a mistake that's not what that means that means there's room for improvement and we all have room for improvement. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Do we have any questions, comments? Anything anybody wants to add? Sister G does. There she is. <laughs> I noticed they took his sis and everything. Uh huh. Ishbosheth. Mm -hmm. And put him in Abner's tomb. They did. Why? Because Abner was buried with honor. Okay. And so 
Um, it's a little bit interesting because it should have been like a family tomb. But where are the bodies of Saul and his sons? Mm -hmm. So whenever Saul had his first battle was when the uh, Jabesh Gilead or whatever it was. It was one of those compound names like that. Kiriath, Kiriath or something other. I don't remember. Whoever it was. They had that issue where the enemy came in. They're like, we want to poke out all of your eyes or one eye, whatever. And Saul saves the day. So those men had great respect and honor for Saul. And so when Saul was killed and the Philistines took his body and, and whatever, they went and rescued his body and buried it in their town. So they, he, Saul and his sons didn't have like their own grave like they were supposed to. They were kept in that city. So technically, that's where Ishbosheth should have been was with the family. But David right now is kind of focused on what's happening in the kingdom. Later on, after you see, um, it's kind of a bloody story, but God is actually allowing, re not revenge, what is the word? Um, I don't know what the word is. But when Saul was alive, he attacked, the, I think it was the Gibeonites. When he wasn't supposed to, God told him not to, and he attacked them anyway. Well, then there comes this huge famine, and God, David goes to God, and he's like, well, why is this famine happening? Have we dishonored you somehow? And God says, yes, it's because the Israelites attacked Gibeon when Saul was king. And so David sends to the Gibeonites, and he's like, how can I make this right? And the Gibeonites are like, give us, uh, it was like six or something like that, of Saul's sons. Okay, remember all that? And so David gives Rizba, the concubine's sons, and Saul's daughter's sons to the Gibeonites, and they kill them, and they hang them out on the wall. And Saul's concubine, Rizba, stays out there for like a month, waving the tigers and the birds and the bees and all that away from her son's bodies. Well, it's at that, that time that David remembers that Saul and Jonathan's bodies are not where they're supposed to be, and he goes and retrieves them. And so that, that's kind of it, all a place of burial is. So when he retrieves them, does he put them in there with Abner? Or does he take a, a, a He takes them back. I think he takes them back to Jerusalem. But he whatever it is, he buries them with the honors of a king like it's supposed to happen. So Ishbish, see, Abner was the family of Saul. So they would have been put together. I thought it might have something to do with, which it probably doesn't, that, that the love that the they say that word. Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth had for Abner, and then he mourned because he couldn't do nothing because that Abner was dead. That when he died, they put him in there with Abner. I think it was because Abner was buried with honor as a military leader that was faithful to Saul and to Ishbosheth, and so he was placing him as like the second hand man in under the kingship. Um, I don't know that for sure, but I know he talked about Ishbosheth being a righteous man, not necessarily because of who he was, but because of the position he held. And he called Saul a righteous man, not because Saul was righteous, but because Saul's position was. Right. And he called Abner a righteous man, not because Abner made all the righteous decisions, but because of the position that Abner had. So I, I think that that was the secession and why why he was placed there. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, and a place of burial was very important, especially in the time that this is happening because of the Jewish traditions and keeping the body intact and together. But you can't do that if your head's in one place and your body's somewhere else. And then, you know, like, you're just scattered. But anyway, any other thoughts, questions, ideas? No? All right. Well, then let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for knowledge and understanding, God. Lord, we love you and we praise you, Jesus, and we thank you, God, for what you're doing and what you're going to do. God, I ask that you would touch all of our hearts and our minds, Lord. Reveal yourself to us, God, in a new and a fresh way, Lord, and help us, Jesus, to walk in the understanding of who we are in you. God, order our steps this week, dear Jesus. Help us to walk in your way, Lord. God, I worship you and I praise you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. We praise you, Lord, and worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
you are officially dismissed. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you joined us on Facebook Family Live, Sister Olivia is about to turn that off for me. Very good. And we will see you either at prayer tomorrow night or church Sunday morning. Bye. Mm -hmm.